Okay, so this is where we left off in the last video. So we'll continue talking about the Depylon crater. And you can see that there's a lot of decoration covering the whole uh, crater. And the rim of the crater has kind of this pattern on it that's actually called a key pattern um, or meander pattern. Um, and there's little stylized M's in all of the M-shaped um, icons all throughout all, every empty space. So there's really not very many areas of empty space. It's all filled in with some sort of either geometric abstraction or figure. Um, we can see in the um, lines of this piece, there's not a lot of curved lines. There are some, but not many. And it's mostly angular in nature. And this is where the term geometric comes into play. So the widest part of the vase is where the human figures are shown, and then that horse-drawn chariot, chariot, which you can see here. Um, and here's some figures here, and I believe they are holding shields. And so this is a figure which is prominent, and this is the figure of the dead man. And so this vase actually was on top of a man's grave, and it was left open throughout the whole thing. So there wasn't actually a bottom to this crater so that people that were visiting the grave could pour libations or offerings of wine to the deceased and it would go right down the middle and on top of the grave of the man below it. So this is actually a grave marker. And we can see that the deceased man is actually pictured here. He's laid out on this frame of sorts. Um, so the figures on this piece are very flat and consist of simple shapes. And the conventional composite figure approach is taken here. The frontal torso profile head, frontal singular eye is what we're seeing here, which was common in ancient Egypt as well. So they're borrowing from ancient Egypt in their figural representation with this piece. And the dead man is clearly male because there is actually, if you look closer, there is a penis. And then if we look at the females, they have little lines under their armpits that show um, breasts. So the painter, the Depilon painter, was concerned about showing gender, but he's not trying to accurately depict the human body in this piece. And there's really no spatial depth in the composition of this piece. It's all pattern. Um, but the pieces do represent a turning point in Greek art. So after the Dark Ages, this is one of the first examples of art that is bringing back the human figure. So that Greek Dark Age, you know, there really wasn't very many representations of the human figure. And so this is one of the early examples of the rebirth of the human figure in Greek art. And it is also a rebirth of narrative in art as well after the long area, um, period of, of Greek, um, the Greek Dark Age. So this is the other piece by the Depilon painter, very similar. Um, it's an amphora, which was a storage vessel. Typically, you know, you would store olive oil or any kind of storage. A lot of, lot of different kinds of foods were stored in amphoras, but we're going to kind of glance over this one. We're going to go to this one here called Hero and Centaur. And this is Heracles and Nessos from Olympia. They believe it's Heracles and Nessos. I'm not totally sure. The date on that is 750, 730 BCE. It's made out of bronze and it's fairly small. It's four and a half inches high. So this is an example of geometric sculpture. So this was found in Greece. It's dated back to the geometric period and it shows two figures locked in a hand-to-hand -hand combat. And the man is thought to be the hero, Heracles, which is the Greek version of Hercules. Um, and his opponent is a centaur, possibly Nessos. They think it's a man named Nessos from some of the Greek mythology. And in the mythology, Nessos volunteered to help Heracles with carry his wife across the river. But he actually ended up carrying her across the river, um, and he also assaulted her in the process. So that's probably the context for this artwork. It's Heracles fighting with Nessos because Nessos assaulted his wife. And it shows us that the Greek 
geometric artists are not limited to only showing scenes of daily life. They're also interesting in, interested in depicting scenes from mythology. So the, comp the composite creature, the centaur here, is a common artistic theme in Greek art. And composite creature, creatures are actually found in a lot of Mesopotamian art. So if you guys remember the Lamassu or Egyptian art like the Sphinx. And so it's kind of a a thing that's passed down from Mesopotamia and Egypt. But the centaur is a purely Greek invention. So and the centaur is half man, half horse. And we can see they they usually depict it as a, a horse's body um, with a man's torso on top. This one's a little different. It's a full-fledged man with a horse coming out the back. So it's a little different than most representations of centaurs, but still half horse, half man. Um, so we can see the figure's beards and they have helmets on and we can see their male. Um, the man Heracles is bigger, which may indicate that he will be the victor, that he's the hero, possibly that he's more important. There might be a little bit of hierarchy of scale going on there. And both are nude, which is a common convention in Greek art. So Greek men exercised nude and even competed in the Olympics games nude, and they were really obsessed with the human body being perfect, much like their proportions in their buildings, and, and a lot of their art was focused on perfection. Um, so so were their ideals of the human body. And so showing nudity was common in Greek culture. So this also is kind of a representation of man versus nature, right? Or man versus chaos. Um, man usually wins the day in Greek culture. <clears throat> and reason always conquers uh, over chaos, typically. Which would be, you know, the centaur is actually a representation of of the bad guy or of chaos in this piece, in this piece as well, which is consistent with what with what we'll see in ancient Greek art moving forward. So we're going to move into the Orientalizing period um, during the seventh century. Greek trade really started to pick up, and colonization really accelerated, and artwork from the East became more pronounced in their culture, and it actually began to influence the style of the Greek art. And we see a heavy influence from Egypt and Mesopotamia during this orientalizing period. So we're going to take a look at a piece called Manticlos um, Apollo. It's a statuette of a youth depicted at, by Manticlos um, to Apollo from Thebes, Greece, 700 to 680 BCE. It's bronze and it's eight inches high. So this is the eight, the seventh century sculpture called Manticlos Apollo from Thebes, Greece, and it's small, eight inches high, and scratched into the thighs of the figure is a message to Apollo on Manticlos's behalf. So it is a votive piece that was left behind by Manticlos, and it does have um, a message to Apollo scratched on it on his behalf. And we do know that this is. Um, that this piece shows interest in the human anatomy, which is somewhat unusual in older art. Um, it features the pectoral and ad abdominal muscles. So we can see there's some lines that kind of delineate where those features are. And that's kind of rare as well. We haven't seen a lot of interest in how to accurately depicting the world around us yet. We've just been seeing a lot of stylization and, and non-realistic representations of, of different things and of figures. So this is one of the first figures where we can really see that interest in human anatomy and actually showing um, things as they really are in real life. And so the long hair frames the neck and the face is rather triangular. And it once had inla inlaid eyes at one point. So we'll move on. This is a Corinthian black figure amphora with annual animal friezes from Rhodes, Greece. 620 to 600 BCE, and it's a foot and two inches high. So there was a city-state under the Greek rule called Corinth, and it really had a thriving trade in ceramics during the seventh century specifically. So this is a Corinthian amphora, which is a storage vessel, and the decoration does show a fascination with the Orient, so that all those Greek trade routes that were really opening up during the Orientalizing period 
that were headed east, which would have been, um, you know, Egypt and and the Orient. Um, it's really influencing Greek art at this point. So we can see those horizontal bands or those registers are dividing up the figure of the or the form of the vase. And we can see boars, exotic lions, which are not native to Greece. So that is a huge indicator that they're being influenced by another culture. And then panthers and composite creatures are shown. So composite creatures are most likely inspired by Eastern monsters, like I mentioned before, like the Sphinx and the Lamassu. And here we actually see a siren, which is a part bird, part woman. And I believe she's right here. So here's the wings and then the face of the of the woman with the longer hair here. So that's a siren. And that's a composite creature that's, I believe, um, Greek in origin. Um, they made that one up. But the convention of composite creatures comes from other cultures, such as Mesopotamia and Egypt. And on the neck of the amphora, there's an example of um, another siren. So up here. So there's a, several sirens in this piece. So this is actually called a black figure painting. So the way that that was made was the painter first put down black silhouettes on a clay surface and then used a sharp tool to incise details within the forms. So they lay down that slip of black, um, black clay, which is a black glaze, and then they just carve into it with a sharp tool to create these lighter pieces and the, the details within. And then they added um, highlights with white or red over the black figures before they actually fired this piece. And the clay is actually the cream color. And this style of painting was very popular. And it had, it was very marketable. A lot of places liked this type of pottery. And so they traded a lot. And the network was very, very wide for Corinthian black figure um, pottery. And it was so popular that the Athenians soon start to copy the Corinthians and start making their own pottery. Um, I think I still have a little time, so we'll keep going. So uh, we're going to go to this one here, Lady of Exir, Exir from Crete, probably Eleutherna, Greece, 650 to 625 BCE. And this is limestone. And this is a... Um, example of a style called Dedalic after the legendary artist Dedalus. And his name means the skillful one. And we're not sure if this is a woman or a deity, but she is clothed. clothed. And most women and goddesses during this time are depicted as, as uh, being clothed. And the men typically will be nude. And it's not surprising that they're depicted differently because women are not treated the same as men in they're not equal to men, so it's not surprising that they're depicted differently. Um, so women are typically always um, shown clothed in Greek culture, where the men are, are nude. Her placement um, of her right hand across her chest is probably a gesture of prayer, which indicates that this is a core, K-O-R-E, and that's a maiden or unmarried human woman. Um, and this statue probably came from the cemetery at Eleutherna in, Greek, in Crete. So as you can see, the style is much more naturalistic when compared with the geometric sculptures that we looked at. But the love of abstract shapes is still evident. You know, her face is triangular. There's hair on either side of her face. There's, her skirt actually has a lot of pattern in it. And the Greeks did leave the sculpture, um, the the fleshy areas like of the hands and face, the color of the stone, and they would just wax it. But they did actually paint the other parts of the sculpture with a waxy paint called encaustic. Um, it's a medium that was very durable, made with beeswax, and lasted a long time. So I think I'm going to stop the video here, and we'll start up with the archa archaic period in the next video.